America dismantles pirate nations for touching their boats. The Barbary Wars. This guy with storytelling is 10 out of 10. Make sure you go check him out. The link will be in the description. Before we do get into this, a lot of you guys are not subscribed to the channel. If you guys don't mind hitting that subscribe button down below, it'd really mean a lot. But yeah, let's jump into this and check this out, man. Ah, uh, yes, that time that pirates kept messing with American ships. So George Washington founded the United States Navy to do something about it. Yeah, right. The United States Navy was founded for the sole reason of hunting pirates. Oh, it was founded right. for that Today specific reason? The Barbary Wars. Ladies and gentlemen, it is pretty uh -huh. much an ongoing internet joke that you do not mess with America's boats, you know, because of, of Operation Praying Mantis, that time that America decided they were going to sink half of Iran's Navy in like eight hours. Uh -huh. and, and Vietnam and, and World War II and World War I and the Spanish-American War. Hey, listen, just don't touch America's boat. Simple as. And the War of 1812. <laughs> We're still um, going. I guess if you're not picking up what I'm putting down, I'm trying to tell you, this is the origin story of why you don't mess with America's boats. All right, here's the deal. For three centuries, pirates from the Barbary states of Morocco, Algiers, Tunis, and Tripoli would raid merchant vessels in the Mediterranean, steal all the goods, and imprison and turn all of the crew members into slaves. Uh, so pirates. why is this allowed to go on for over 300 years? Well, the only navies powerful enough to stop these pirates at the time were the Spanish, the French, and the British. And hey! they all came to the same conclusion that it would be cheaper to pay off the pirates, giving them a yearly tribute to not raid their ships rather than go to war with them. Oh, so wow. now those three really? empires aren't getting their ships raided, which is fine. That's a good thing, I guess. But here's the catch with it that they may or may not have known at the time, but they definitely figured out somewhere along the way. Now the pirates are only raiding all the smaller nations. Okay, it's like uh. Walmart, Target, and Amazon getting together, encouraging shoplifting, knowing that they can shoulder <laughs> the financial burden, but it puts all the other mom and pop stores out of business and they become- Yo, that example is mad, bro. All the big shops- Hey, they're like, you know what, shoplifters, that's fine. You guys go shoplift the smaller shops. We'll, we'll pay you guys to do so, whatever, right? Boom. I'm the only ones selling goods. Except instead of retail stores, we're talking about entire nations. This uh. goes on for literally hundreds of years, but America is still part of the British Empire, so they fall under their umbrella of protection, so it's never an issue. Uh. That was until the American Revolution started on April 19th, 1775, with the shot heard around the world, the Battle of Lexington and Concord, and the famous story of a 78-year-old veteran going out into his front yard and shooting three redcoats as they retreated back to Boston, sending the message for all of America that the British Empire should get off of our lawn. Festival oh, wait, wait, is that an actual movie? Yo, that would be really good for me to check out and maybe, like, check it out with you guys as well somehow. Towards 1783, America wins the Revolutionary War, officially becoming its own country, and all of America's merchant vessels start flying the old red, white, and blue. Boom. And pretty much immediately, 1784, one of America's merchant vessels is captured by Barbary pirates from the country of Morocco. Uh -oh. As an act of good faith for a new nation, Spain actually pays off the pirates, gets the American vessel and all of its crew back, returns it to America, and then advises the American government, hey, you guys should start paying these guys off too. That's what all the big nations are doing. Hey, that's not bad from Spain though. That's not, hey, they got it back for them. Got them back and then be like, yo, listen, we're paying, you know what, America being America, they're like, yo, we ain't paying no one. We ain't paying no... Hey, hey, we're gonna get right into it right now, man. At which point, America's minister to France, a guy by the name of Thomas Jefferson, chimes in, and he's like, no, absolutely not. I'm gonna go talk to him. Now, obviously, <laughs> I'm paraphrasing here, but basically, Thomas Jefferson rolls up, and he's like, hey, don't ever fuck with my boats ever again or else. At which point, the uh -huh. Sultan of Morocco is like, I'm sorry, who are you? I'm Thomas Jefferson, one of the founding fathers of America. You know, we just kicked the British out of our entire country. We're our own thing now. I'm sorry, you fucking pilgrims did what now? We beat the British in war and now we are our own country. You mean to tell me that a bunch of colonial farmers with muskets went toe to toe with the largest military on the planet. Wow. So good at war that they can literally wear high vis red coats the entire time and still win and you beat them. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Yo, you're making this so bad, bro. Well, listen, hey, listen, it happened. You guys kicked us out. I'm telling you. I mean, yeah, I could probably just leave your boats alone from now on. That historically <laughs> seems like it's going to be a really good idea. And that is the story of how Morocco came to be the first country to recognize America as its own sovereign nation by signing the Moroccan-American Treaty of Peace and Friendship, which is the first and longest lasting wow. peace treaty in American history. At which point Thomas Jefferson is- Wait, if they sign that- and did that, then where are we going with this story? America dismantles pirate nations for... Alright, all right, maybe, maybe there's more. 
Well, Pyra is about. Like, wow, that actually worked out perfect. I'm going to go to the other three Barbary states and tell them the same thing now. But of hey, course, hey. there's going to be a catch with that. You see, there's, there's loads of Barbary, Barbary states. states, but Morocco is the only one that's actually truly in. Uh, so it's all these, right? So America side with Morocco. Morocco was like, okay, yeah, we ain't going to mess with you, but you got Al um, Algeria, Tunisia, and Tripoli. Right, okay. Independent. And the other three are just subservient branches of the Ottoman Empire. So Thomas Jefferson and John right. Adams go to talk to the ambassador of Tripoli and they're like, hey, can all the Ottoman Barbary states leave our boats alone? At which point the ambassador informs them, absolutely not. You see, we're part of the Ottoman Empire. We don't need to listen to you. We're not scared of you guys. And it is our official stance that, and I quote, it was written in the Quran that all nations which had not acknowledged the prophet were sinners who it was the right and duty of the faithful to plunder and enslave. Oh, wow. You know, unless they give us money, of course. Everything's got a price, <laughs> apparently. So Thomas Jefferson of is course. like, well, okay, we're going to war then. And that's when John Adams is like, whoa, 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 calm down. Let's just pay Relax. the tribute so that our ships can be fine. We already disbanded the Continental Navy after winning the Revolutionary War. We don't have a Navy to fight these guys. We just have to give them the money. So that's what happened for the... So now, America, we make the Navy. And just destroyed them, right? Next eight to ten years, America would pay tribute every year to these oh. three remaining Barbary states. And every year, they wanted more and more money. And eventually, Sucking even them that dry. wasn't enough. Because Algiers began attacking American vessels anyways. Okay, Yo, up. wait, what? Hey, hey, this is hey, this is why you can't trust pirates, man. Hey, just made the Navy straight away and just, just destroyed them. You know what I'm saying? ...to these three remaining Barbary states, and every year they wanted more and more money. And Hell no. Nah. even that wasn't enough, because Algiers began attacking American vessels anyways. Wow. Okay, if you're not picking up what I'm putting down, I'm trying to tell you that for the first time in American history, somebody has fucked with one of America's boats, and they're not immediately sorry about it. Oh, it's gonna go down. Yet. The president at the time, George Washington, goes to Congress and pretty much tells them what's going to happen because at this point in time, George Washington is basically the king of America. Nobody actually knows if he's going to step down from presidency or not. So he's <laughs> like, hey, guess what? You guys are going to pass the Naval Act of 1794, establishing the United States Navy. And at the very top of that document, uh -huh. it very clearly states that the purpose we are building the United States Navy is so that we can combat Algerine Corsairs, which wow. is just a fancy word for state-funded pirates. Yes, I'm telling you that the founding document of the most powerful navy the world has ever seen at the top specifically states the sole reason for their creation is to hunt down and destroy pirates that had the audacity to Fuck with one of America's ships. Yo, that is cool though. That is a cool beginning. You know what I mean? That's actually a really cool story. I know it's like quite funny when you compare it now. Like America's biggest navy was all star because of a you know pirates was attacking some ships. You know what I mean? But I, I like that. I like that. We've officially entered the find out portion of the story. America immediately commissions the building of six enormous frigates covered in guns to go fight these uh -oh. pirates. Fast forward to when the frigates are done. It takes a couple years. It is now 1798, and George Washington has decided to step down from power, allowing for an election to happen. And we are now into the second president of America, John Adams. And John Adams decides. Uh -huh. He would rather keep paying tribute. Disappointed! Adams, what is he doing, man? Adams, 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 listen. You've been paying for 10 years and they're still attacking, bro. Did you not get the memo? We're making the biggest navy here. And then you pay him more? Bro, Adams, come on, dude. And John Adams decides he would rather keep paying tribute. Disappointed! <laughs> America just created the Navy, spent a million dollars creating all these frigates, and now John Adams isn't going to use them for their intended purpose. Wow. Obviously, a lot of people are upset, including his own vice president, Thomas Jefferson. Wow. So Thomas Jefferson, the vice president at the time, immediately begins campaigning to run against the sitting president in the next election. And one of his biggest uh -huh. platforms is that he is going to go fight these pirates rather than pay them tribute. And his slogan for this is, and I quote, millions in defense before a cent in tribute okay just so we're clear thomas jefferson's platform for running for president is i'm going to spend millions of dollars in defense <laughs> which might as well be hundreds of billions of dollars at that point because of yeah i was gonna say the equivalent of the money like in today's world it would be billions right or like it would be a lot anyway more than millions america no longer negotiates with terrorists and i'm pretty sure my high school english teacher would refer to this as 
foreshadowing. So Thomas Jefferson <laughs> wins the election. The entire world finds out that he's going to be the third president of the United States of America. Uh, and then on March 4th, 1801, the day of his inauguration, he receives a letter from Yusuf Karmanali, the Pasha of Tripoli. If you don't know, Pasha is like the dictator, the king, the president, the, the main dude in charge. And at right. this point, Thomas Jefferson, the guy who just ran an entire presidential campaign on, I'm going to go fight pirates, is thinking in his head, like, maybe <laughs> this guy found out that I'm about to send the Navy over there to beat him. Yo, this is some Captain Jack Sparrow stuff, man. Hey, hey, Jefferson, I'm going to refer, refer you as Captain Jack the whole entire way now. Forever, bro. You are now kept by Captain Jack, dude. The guy who just ran an entire presidential campaign on, I'm going to go fight pirates. Captain is Jack. thinking in his head, like, maybe... This guy found out that I'm about to send a Navy over there to beat him up and he's going to send an apology. Maybe he wants to sign a peace treaty like Morocco. Nah. Did. This is already working out great. I might not kiss have to us. send my Navy over there. He opens the letter and Pasha Yusuf Karmanali has decided that he is going to poke the Pilgrim King because he is now demanding that because of the new administration, the United States owes him an extra $225,000 in tribute. And Thomas Jefferson. Oh, the cheek. Oh, the cheek. Bro, the guy ran a campaign to kick the asses of pirates, right? And the pirate, the leader of the pirates and that would whatever is now sending them saying you, you gotta pay us more money. Bro, bro, ah, uh, ah, uh, he's gonna bro, he's gonna go crazy. Captain Jack's gonna go crazy, man. Sin is pissed. You trying to get crazy with us, eh? Don't you know I'm local? <laughs> Originally, Thomas Jefferson was going to have to go to Congress, get permission to activate the Navy, to send them over there to fight these pirates, but not now. He's so mad, we're activating the rainbow shortcut to ass whooping land, and Pasha Yusuf is going to have some consequences immediately because he's sending the Navy today. But like I oh, said, it's a literal act of Congress to send the U.S. Navy over there on a military mission, so Thomas Jefferson is like, that's fine, we just won't send them on a military mission. Fill up one of our frigates with a bunch of gifts and peace offerings for Pasha Yusuf, and then give it a nice, healthy escort of other frigates to defend it and send them on their merry way uh, to deliver the gifts. Right after he right? gives the commander of the United States Navy the standing order that he is also to defend any American citizen or ship from any potential aggression. It, ma yo, no. it makes sense. It makes sense. Send some gifts there. And if you get attacked, what are you going to do? Just be attacked? Now you're going to defend yourselves. <laughs> aggression. Potential aggression. If he thinks that somebody else might be thinking about doing something aggressive. Oh, okay. Okay, so even if you think that they're thinking of doing the thinking thing of attacking, then you can attack. Smart. Smart way of going about it. If he thinks that somebody else might be thinking about doing something aggressive. <laughs> I'll take him down. Do your... <laughs> Your stuff. So the Navy sets sail. They're gone. They're in route. Thomas Jefferson's sitting in his office and he comes to the realization, man, I'm pretty sure these pirates are going to attack him. But if they don't, they're actually going to end up giving Pasha what's his nuts a bunch of these gifts. <laughs> and I can't have it. So he whips out the old quill and parchment. And he writes a letter back. Wait, yeah. Oh, wait. wait. <laughs> Bro, I absolutely love this guy and these stories, man. But yo, imagine that the pirates didn't attack and now they're just chilling with all the gifts. Bro, just imagine. But he's gonna, he's gonna poke the bear with his letter watch. A bunch of these gifts and I can't have it. So he whips out the old quill and parchment and he writes a letter back yep. and sends that off. And that letter basically reads, hey, America's done giving you tribute for the rest of forever. Yep. F off. And obviously the letter makes it there first, at which point Pasha goes to the American consulate building and chops down the flagpole with the American flag on it which in that part of oh, the world mad. is how you declare war. So the U.S. Navy shows up off the coast of the Barbary States. The pirates attack them because they've already declared war. The U.S. Navy defends themselves. Word gets back to America. Congress then is like, oh, hey, we're at war. We're going to go ahead and give Thomas Jefferson permission to use the United States Marine Corps at his discretion. Why he wants it? Why to this day, the United States Marine Corps is the only branch of the U.S. military that can be sent and deployed anywhere in the world without congressional approval. So for the next two years, the U.S. Oh, Navy wow. and the Marine Corps set up a naval blockade and just go on a pirate hunting extravaganza <laughs> until October of 1803, when the USS Philadelphia would get hung up on an uncharted reef right off the coast of Tripoli. The pirates seize this opportunity. They attack 
the USS Philadelphia, board it, take the crew hostage. Oh, wow. And over the next couple months, no they way. were able to repair it enough to get it back into the harbor at Tripoli, where they then anchored it in place and used it as fixed artillery because it had way more guns than any other vessel they had. Yo! Our first main character, Stephen Decatur, the commander of the USS Enterprise, America's unofficial flagship. He decides that he's going to don his plot armor, take the USS Enterprise out, and acquire himself a pirate ship, which he does. He then takes that pirate ship and the USS Enterprise and sails both of them to Sicily, where he hires <laughs> five Sicilian mercenaries that know how to speak Arabic. Right. They then sail back to Tripoli, where Decatur and 80 Marines are going to go below deck of this pirate ship, which has now been christened the USS Intrepid, as the five mercenaries are going to sail directly into the heart of the harbor, pretending to be Barbary pirates. They then go directly uh -huh. to the USS Philadelphia. 80 Marines and Stephen Decatur run out, kill the entire crew of pirates that are on the USS Philadelphia and reclaim it. Unfortunately, the USS Philadelphia- Yo, these pirates messed up, man. We're already halfway and this has got messy, bro. Hey, hey they, they was taking the ships, like attacking the ships when America was paying. Bro, what do you think is going to happen, man? What do they think? They just didn't know what was coming. They just didn't know. Philadelphia is too damaged to actually be used as a ship ever again, at which point Stephen Decatur decides, fine, we're just going to burn the entire thing to the ground because if we can't have it, no one can. Yep. Deprive the enemy of nice things. I'm Smart. pretty sure Sun Tzu said that. So that's exactly what they do. They light the USS Philadelphia on fire. They're positive it can't be put out. And then they bounce. Not a single American is injured. And Stephen Decatur is Crazy. called a hero because he has now led what is, in my opinion, America's first special operations mission. So now that that's taken care of, the problem that was cool. is that the crew of the USS Philadelphia is still being held hostage by the Barbary pirates. And they want a ton of money in exchange for them back however america no longer negotiates with terrorists and that's not an option makes sense Cue our next two main characters william eaton and presley o'bannon and before Hi. you ask yes presley o'bannon as in the uss o'bannon the fletcher class destroyer from world war ii that sank a japanese submarine with potatoes so they go in and they pitch their idea of how they're going to get the crew of the uss philadelphia back and it is by every definition a special operations mission Basically oh wait okay v right so I thought the Philadelphia uh, hostages was on the ship hostage. Okay, so when he actually went and it got the ship and then set on fire and killed everyone on the ship, the hostages aren't there, obviously. So now they gotta do another special mission and try and get them right. And this is this. And it is by every definition, a special operations mission. Basically, they want to take themselves two dudes plus six Marines for a total of eight, eight guys. And they're going to get dropped off in Egypt because in Egypt is Yusuf Karmali's brother that is living in exile because Yusuf kicked him out because he is technically the rightful heir of Tripoli. So they're going to get that guy and all the buddies that are loyal to him, like 500 men. And wow. they're going to march them through the desert to Derna, where they are then going to use them to fight and take over the city and exchange the city for the crew of the USS Philadelphia. And Bro, this does not sound like real life. Eight men, American men, go to Egypt, find a rifle ear of Egypt, find all his men that's loyal to him, 500, and then go and take over a city with... Bro, that sounds like a story or a movie. And upon hearing this ridiculous plan, the U.S. military leadership is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You want to take a small contingency of men, be dropped off in a foreign country, meet up with a rebel leader who already has a bunch of men, and then convince him that you're going to help him overthrow a current dictator, and then he can be the new dictator. And basically, we're using other people to fight other people that we don't like to benefit us. And Presley O'Bannon and Eaton are like, yeah, that's, that's pretty much exactly it. And the government is like, this is a terrific idea. I mean, we're probably never, ever going to do anything like this ever again. And we're not going to have an entire branch of special forces that specializes in it. Sorry. Anyways, that's exactly what they do. They <laughs> dropped off in Egypt. They tracked down Hamet. They're like, hey, you want to go overthrow your brother? Cool. Grab your guys. Let's go. Somewhere along the way, the Marines also picked up 50 Greek mercenaries as they all began marching 500 miles through the Libyan desert. To this get is back mental. To the Metropolitan coast. And this march through the desert takes 50 days and it is a complete shit show because somewhere along the way, they start running low on supplies and they have to start rationing. And then some people get mad. There's accusations because the Greek guys are Christian. Hamet's guys are Muslims. 
There's fighting amongst themselves. Oh, God. There's these eight Marines standing in the middle, desperately trying to keep them from killing each other as they march through the desert. They, so I mean, <laughs> they've not even got there yet, man. Attempts and a ton of fights, the Marines were able to keep this group together enough to make it through the Libyan desert till they arrived at the coastal city uh. of Bomba. Once they get there, they meet up with the USS Argus that gives them a bunch of supplies so they can start eating food again, and they give enough money to pay off the Greek mercenaries. Then... Eaton decides that he's going to send a letter over to the governor of Derna right next door. Because remember, we can't attack unless they're potentially aggressive. Okay, so he sends a letter and is basically like, hey, I'm going to march my army through the middle of your town to go kill your boss on my way. Bro, these rules just make it even better, man. How they literally got to send a letter to provoke them so they can attack, bro. Tripoli, um... Can I have some safe passage and maybe some food? The governor of Derna sends a letter back that says, my head or yours, which sounds potentially aggressive. Oh, with it. So they begin making the plan for the ground attack. Hamet and his men are going to take the governor's palace, and the marines and the Greek mercenaries are going to take out the harbor fortress. But to do that, they're going to need a cannon from the USS Argus, so they're going to meet up with it, go get this cannon, and prepare for their attack. Cut back to Stephen Decatur. While all this has been happening, there's still been a naval battle in the Mediterranean the entire time. Oh, wow. Stephen Decatur is on an absolute rampage, because <laughs> after he captured his first pirate ship, he would receive word that his brother, James Decatur, had been mortally wounded by one of the pirate ship's captains, who was pretending to surrender before shooting his younger brother. Upon hearing this, Decatur wow. gives command of the new captured vessel to one of his men, leaves a couple guys with him, and takes off to track down this pirate ship that just killed his brother. So they they chase down this pirate ship. They bro, you can, you already know, like the expression on his face, man. That, that bro is on a hunt. Pull up right next to it. And before the crew has time to do any boarding procedures, you know, like break out the planks, tie some ropes to the other ship, all that stuff you see in the movies. Nah, Stephen right. Decatur jumps into the enemy ship and starts killing pirates immediately. Nine Marines seeing that happen are like, oh shit, we're doing this. So they jump <laughs> onto the pirate ship too and start throwing down. At which point the pirate ship veers off and breaks away from Decatur's ship. It is now nine Marines and Stephen Decatur versus over 30 pirates on this vessel and third bro do you know what's crazy right the marines are always outnumbered and they always just seem to absolutely just destroy everyone and everything without many casualties bro they are built different they you guys in america are just built different he is not going to be enough stephen decatur kills multiple pirates including the captain that had slain his brother officially avenging his brother's death capturing that vessel as well but he is still Incredible. absolutely furious that his brother died and he continues to go on a rampage yeah capturing another pirate ship and destroying three more over the coming weeks <sighs> cut back to the men on the ground eating and obeying Bro, listen if i was him as well and my brother was killed i'm gonna do the same thing i'm gonna go on a rampage until there's no more of those pirates anymore bro i'm telling you right now you kill my brother like what do the pirates kill the brother they're all gone. They're all, all gone or I'm gone. And had been getting their battle plan ready this entire time. They just had their men go get a cannon off the USS Argus because they really, really need this cannon if they're going to be able to pull off this mission. So they're ready to attack. The US Navy gets into formation and they are going to bombard the entire city of Derna while they launch this attack. Despite that, right. there's over 2,000 men loyal to Pasha Yusuf that are going to defend it. And they are heavily up. So, Navy starts bombarding the Again. shore, Hamet and his men take off to go attack the governor's palace, and Eaton, O'Bannon, the Marines, and the Greek mercenaries begin launching their attack on the harbor fortress. They open up with the initial cannon fire, which is going to be vital to be able to break through the enemy lines and establish their foothold. They fire the cannon. As they go to reload and fire it again, they realize that they had accidentally forgot to take the ramrod out of the cannon and shot that at the enemy too. Now the cannon's completely out, and they're kind of like, oh shit, what do we do? What do we do? Wait, I don't know what ramrod is. Is it? What is that? And Presley O'Bannon just charges into battle as the other Marines follow behind him and the Greek mercenaries behind them. They wow. attack so quickly and so violently that they're able to overrun the entire enemy fortress before anybody really knows what's going on. And Presley O'Bannon becomes the first American ever to raise the Star Spangled Banner over a foreign battlefield. This battle, the taking Damn. of the coastal city of Derna, is enshrined in Marine Corps history in the Marine Corps hymn with the line 
line from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. And it is also where the Marine Corps would get their first nickname ever because the seven Marines present for this battle fought so hard and so violently that they simply became known as the Leathernecks, referring to the leather collar that they wore around their neck to protect it from slashes from pirate swords. So useless men end up getting- Is that what they wore? Bro, that's smart. Wait, but like, how did it take it so easily? Yeah, a cannon went and they got like 500 men there and they got, you know, you got the 50, uh, the Greek mercenaries, right? But it's like, there was 2,000 men. How did it just take it so easily? ...that they wore around their neck to protect it from slashes from pirate soldiers. That's smart. So useless men end up getting beaten back and are forced to retreat to Tripoli, at which point the Marines, the Greeks, and Hamet and his men all consolidate, figure out what happened. Hamet and his men were able to take over the governor's palace. And after the taking of the city of Derna, Hamet awards his very own sword to Presley O'Bannon as a gift for how valiantly he fought in battle. And this cool. is the Mameluke sword, the same sword that is on the Marine Corps uniform today. So now you oh, it's a cool sword. His military sends an enormous army back to Derna to try to take it back over. And they're kind of just sitting on the outskirts of the city, waiting for the right moment to attack. Eaton and O'Bannon are writing correspondence to the U.S. military in the chain of command like, hey, we took this entire city with like eight Marines. Give us some reinforcements. We're going to go take Tripoli next and then we'll just overthrow this entire country. This goes on for <laughs> over a month and they defend the city multiple times from attacks from Yusuf's men and eventually Eaton receives a letter informing him that he is to stand down and just leave because American diplomat Tobias Locke has struck up a deal with Yusuf Karmanali. And apparently he struck up this deal with absolutely nobody's permission because the deal is America is gonna pay Yusuf Karmanali, the pirate king, $60,000 and in exchange, we are gonna receive the USS Philadelphia back as well as a peace treaty that they are gonna leave American ships alone from- Yo, listen, listen, listen. They've overthrown him, got his brother, right? To be there now. Just run with that story. <laughs> why, are we, why are you paying him again? SS Philadelphia back, as well as a peace treaty that they are going to leave American ships alone from now on. So yeah, everybody's good to pissed off about it from Thomas Jefferson to leave American ships alone from now on. So yeah, everybody's pretty pissed off about it from Thomas right. Jefferson, Presley O'Bannon, William Eaton, Stephen Decatur. They're all furious that we are now giving $60,000 to this pirate king as opposed to overthrowing his entire city of Tripoli or at a minimum using the fact that they're holding Derna and use that as leverage to exchange. But whatever, the war's over, I guess. <laughs> For now. So the peace treaties were signed in 1805. Now, fast forward seven years, 1812, the War of 1812 happens. Okay, if you don't know, the War of 1812, there's more to it than this, but the reason that it started is that Great Britain wanted to have more control over the seas. All right, we're involved, okay. It's gonna be interesting. Trade because America was getting too much because America was no longer getting attacked by pirates because we just beat them in a war now too. So Great Britain launches another war against America. During this huh? war, they encourage the Barbary pirates to start attacking American vessels again. And honestly, it works out pretty good for the pirates, at least for a little while, because the American Navy is too busy to worry about them because their hands are full with the British Navy. Fast forward wow. two years, eight months later, the War of 1812 ends. Now, luckily for the Barbary pirates, Thomas Jefferson is no longer president at this point. We are on to America's fourth president. Let me check my notes here. Um, James Madison. If you don't know, James Madison is one half of what is referred to as the forefathers dynamic duo. And the other half is his best friend of all time, Thomas Jefferson. And I don't know if okay. you figured this out yet at this point in the story, but Thomas Jefferson hates pirates. So <laughs> sitting president James Madison. Uh, listen, listen, maybe just a little bit. The bro started the whole Navy for the pirates, man. Maybe just a little bit, man. But Thomas Jefferson hates pirates pirates. So sitting president James Madison being the homie that he is looks over at now Commodore Stephen Decatur and says, go get him tiger. <laughs> he then proceeds to assemble the largest U.S. naval fleet ever at this point in time and uh, sails directly to the Barbary coast. He oh then no. He tracks down Algiers flagship, the Mashuda, takes it out, captures over 400 members of its crew wow. and the ship itself. He then Wait, that many was on that one ship back in those times? 
How big was the ships? And proceeds to take all of his gunboats directly to Algiers, park them in the port and say, here's the deal. You're going to surrender and you're never going to collect tribute from anyone ever again, or I'm going to overthrow your entire country. Obviously they take the first option at which point Decatur's <laughs> like, okay, cool. Next order of business. You're also going to pay me back for all the U S merchandise that you plundered during the war of 1812. And they're like, okay, here you go. They give it to him. He oh, they're being dominant now. They've had enough. They've had enough. They got the rub president in charge for them. And proceeds to sail his fleet next door to Tunis and tell them the exact same thing. Yo! Ordering them to sign a peace treaty, never raid an American vessel again, and then collects a bunch of money. He then sails them next door again to Tripoli and does the exact same thing. Collects all this money, gets the peace treaties. The Barbary pirates never mess with America ever again. Decatur and his fleet sail back home and he tells the government what happened. The American government is blown away at the results that Decatur was able to achieve when asked how he- Yeah, they were scared after that point. After the 1812 war, they were scared at that, that point. Bro, I don't know how they wasn't scared to begin with. But hey, I, I'm actually annoyed that like America can't look back that- Well, it wasn't America. It was just that guy who made the deal, bro. But hey, you got it in the end. Managed to not only get peace treaties without too much violence, but, but money also back. get a bunch of money and concessions on top of it. All Decatur said was peace was achieved through the mouth of our cannons, at which point <laughs> he was given the nickname the Conqueror of the Barbary Pirates. And That's a cool world, nickname. Seeing a new country in its infancy stand up for itself against the Barbary Pirates and winning, they would start doing it too. And everybody started fighting back and quit paying tribute to the Barbary Pirates. And in the coming years, they're out of business. <laughs> it would fade into nothing as their 300 year reign of terror had come to an end. Crazy. So in conclusion, the moral of the story. That is, is mad, bro. Like what you actually think about it, 300 years of pirate terror and then he just came down to america leading the way into stopping them bro and then it just faded out to nothing please for the love of god do not mess with america's boats thank you for watching yeah Best i've seen channels. two videos now where you shouldn't mess with the boats i mess with any boats i ain't gonna lie i'm on your side i'm on your side but great video enjoyed that hopefully you guys enjoyed as well let me know what you guys think in the comment section if you guys enjoyed make sure to leave a thumbs up subscribe for more content i'm live every single day on twitch.tv4 slash l3wg if you guys want to check me out over there i'll see you on the next one peace